Jesus. And if you would join me in honoring the reading of God's word by standing, I'll share with you a couple of verses from several different translations. You'll find this interesting, I hope. The King James Bible says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. The Holman Christian Standard Bible says, Then the Lord God said, It's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper as his complement. International Standard Version, Later the, God, the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make the woman to be an authority corresponding to him. New American Standard, 1977. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And the Young's Literal Translation, And Jehovah God said, Not good for the man to be alone. I do make to him an helper as his counterpart. And finally, Proverbs 18.22 that says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Thank you. You can be seated. Well, needless to say, I'm deeply moved and honored to be standing in the presence of such an honorable grouping of American ladies of such noteworthy direct lineal genealogical society such as represented here today. Reverend Joseph Adams, quite a heroic fellow himself, buried in Newington uh, in the state of New Hampshire Colonial Dames of the 17th century, New Hampshire Dames of the Court of Honor, Mount Washington Colony of New England Women, New Hampshire Society of U.S. Daughters of 1812. Did I leave anybody out? I hope not. Well, the current generation of society leaders is working hard to fulfill the mandate of the founders to perpetuate the memory of the colonists and their lasting legacy of virtue, courage, and patriotism, uh, words that aren't often spoken, unfortunately, that are the foundations of the character of this great nation. To commemorate the noble and heroic deeds of our ancestors, who were the founders of this great republic. To zealously maintain, and I use the word very cautiously, zealously, for some reason these days, zeal is considered out of character. I don't think so. To zealously maintain the high principles of virtue, courage, and patriotism which led to the independence of the colonies and laid the foundation for the establishment of the United States of America. And so, you have my attention and my salute and my dedication to the self-same objectives that I have just stated that I know that are part of what your organization stand for. And let's just say my challenge to you today, my encouragement is founding fathers, yes, and founding mothers, too. This month, as I'm sure you're well aware, we celebrate and commemorate the Committee of Five of the Second Continental Congress for a team of five men who drafted and presented to the Congress what would become America's Declaration of Independence of July 4, 1776. This Declaration Committee operated from June 11, 1776 until July 5, 1776, the day on which the Declaration was published. And as we speak, the Massachusetts uh, Society Daughters of the American Revolution and Massachusetts Society Sons of the American Revolution are in the Granary Cemetery in Boston on Tremont Street right now paying respect to these very people uh, for the very reason. The Committee of Five of the Second Continental Congress were a team of five men, as I said, who drafted and presented to Congress what would become America's Declaration. The members of this group were John Adams, and of course we know that John Adams uh, has some relationship to one of the namesakes that you're involved with here concerning Joseph Adams, Reverend Joseph Adams. And he was a representative of Massachusetts, became the second U.S. president, as I know you know. Thomas Jefferson, representative of Virginia, became the third president. Benjamin Franklin, um, representative of Pennsylvania, known as one of the most famous of the founding fathers, and our first U.S. minister to France. Another man who actually was involved in signing all four of our foundational documents from Connecticut, Roger Sherman, 
Representative of Connecticut, the only person, as I said, to sign all four of the U.S. state papers. The Continental Association, the Declaration, the Articles of Confederation, and the Constitution. And another man, Robert Livingston, a representative of New York, negotiated the Louisiana Purchase as the minister to France. It was often said when I was growing up, and I heard it frequently, that behind every successful man was a, was a good woman. Founding fathers, yes, and founding mothers too, pioneer mothers. Now, I'm aware that there are many variations and permeations of that saying. I would ask that whoever hears that realizes it's a statement of endearment and honor that should not offend anyone. I also recognize that things have drastically changed in many ways when it comes to gender issues are discussed in 2016. However, for this brief time together here today, let us confine our range of scrutiny to the very eras the societies represented here today cover. I don't know how many of you have ever been there. Certainly it's a pilgrimage, if you will, that everyone should make here in America is to go to Plymouth, which we could call America's hometown in many respects. And if you go across from the Pilgrim or the Mayflower Rock or the Pilgrim Rock or however that you want to refer to it, when you go across the street, you will see that there is a tribute there to the Pilgrim Mothers. It says on the shaft of that fountain that flows behind the statue are listed the names of the women of the Mayflower in whose memory the National Society, Daughters of the American Revolution, gave the statue. The inscription reads, they brought up their families in sturdy virtue and a living faith in God without which nations perish. Founding fathers, yes, and founding mothers, too. I selected today to memorialize, if you will, and to honor today two wives of signers of the Declaration of Independence, and one of those wives are from this committee of five that we had just mentioned, Abigail Smith Adams and Dorothy Quincy Hancock. Now, before I share about these great women, let me tell you why I'm presenting this subject, Founding Fathers Yes and Founding Mothers Too. Many years ago, I won't say how many, but quite a long time ago, as I was praying about and preparing for a talk, I give a lot of those all over the country, I would be giving on a certain group of founding fathers, and there were certainly more, as you know, than a few. Uh, some were very well known and some were not so much well known, so we had really thousands of founding fathers, and correspondingly, I suppose, thousands of founding mothers as well. Well, it occurred to me, and you might call it in a sense an epiphany that I had, uh, that behind and supportive or alongside all these revered founders were women. Mothers, wives, sisters, and female friends and co-laborers, the fiercely courageous women, certainly, who endured tremendous hardship as their husbands fought to build an independent nation. And so I purposed right then and right there to do more research about these women and to learn as well why they did not show up so much in certain accounts, particularly in many of our foundational documents. And it occurred to me, and I have read so many foundational documents, not just of America, but many of the foundational documents of world history that were very influential on the founding of America, like the Magna Carta, for example. And of course, our own, the Mayflower Compact, the Declaration of American Independence, and the United States Constitution, just to make a, if you will, a scant mention of just a few of these, and that there were no women signatures on any of those documents and certainly not uh, that they would not have signed for lack of courage or patriotism. Then why no women's signatures? At first I thought about certain attitudes that I've heard and rumors of such as, keep them pregnant and in the kitchen. But that flew away in the presence of the documented high regard that especially our founding fathers had for their wives. Founding fathers, yes, and founding mothers too. Then I also had to consider that our founding fathers had a biblical worldview and desire to live according to the promises of scripture, uh, such as, but not limited to, the following. Ephesians 5, in the relationship of husbands and wives. Or 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, a man providing for and protecting his family. 
or Philippians 2, 3, do nothing out of selfishness or vain deceit. So why then? Why no women's signatures? Because signing those documents, let me stop for a moment, because signing those documents was considered men's work. Now I know a lot of people will bristle at that. It's not because of gender bias at all. It's because of protection. And think about this. It was dangerous, especially to sign the Declaration of American Independence, which I otherwise call, at least from the British perspective, known as the Confession of Treason to the English Crown. You hear me say that? The Declaration of American Independence, which many people today would say, I'm so glad I would sign that declaration. I would be wonderfully happy to have my signature on that document and be in the Smithsonian. Well, in 1776, you would not have wanted to have your signature on that because this is what would happen to you. It's a confession of treason to the English crown, a jailable, hanging, drawn and quartered, etc., 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 offense. And so the founding mothers certainly suffered too, but not for the lack of loving protection or concern of their fathers and their husbands. Two such women were Abigail Smith Adams and Dorothy Quincy Hancock. Abigail Adams, often known as the First Lady of Faith and Courage, and Courage in the Hall of Heroes or Heroines, a providential view of American history she wrote, and these are her own words, on her husband's election to the presidency. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant ruler over the people. Give unto him an understanding heart, that he may know how to go out and come in before this great people, that he may discern between good and bad. And I can tell you, I'm thankful for my wife to pray that kind of a prayer for me, the way that Abigail Adams prayed for her husband John, on politics that cannot be politically right, which is morally wrong. On the need for Christian society, I am no friend of bigotry, she said, yet I think the freedom of inquiry and the general toleration of religious sentiments have been, like all other good things, perverted, and under their shelter, deism and even atheism have found refuge. And just a little addendum here, I have said there is really no place for an atheist in America. And the reason why is because atheism is not part and parcel with our founding, nor is atheism part and parcel with any of our foundational documents, and certainly not the least of which, of what the Declaration of American Independence says concerning Creator with a capital C. That's very important that we understand that. And the issue of deism, of which has been an accusation made against many different people, including John Adams, John Adams was not a deist, I can tell you that. Neither was, and he was a pastor's son, as uh, Abigail Adams was also a pastor's daughter. They were not deists. And even if they were deists, deists then would not be what deists are today. Deists then meant basically uh, somebody that believed that there was a God and God had created. Today, people have a different view of all these things. What's so important for us, particularly of our millennial societies that we understand what we're really about and that we can teach these things. She also wrote on the issue of slavery. I have sometimes been ready to think that the passion for liberty cannot be equally strong in the breasts of those who have been accustomed to deprive their fellow creature of theirs. Of this I am certain that slavery is not founded upon that generous and Christian principle of doing to others as we would that others should do unto us. Pretty strong words from anybody, and especially we're thankful to hear them from Abigail Adams. On living the Christian life, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, but the God of Israel is he that giveth strength and power unto his people. And now, Dorothy Quincy Hancock. Of course, she had the honor, if you will, of being the wife of the first signer of the Declaration of American Independence, and you know, of course, that John Hancock purposely signed it nice and big so that the King of England could read his name without his spectacles on and offer a very high bounty on his head. She was one of ten children 
of Judge Edmund Quincy and Elizabeth Wendell. She was known as a bright, unspoiled beauty that flattery could not harm, an enthusiastic patriot. She was also present at the Battle of Lexington, and she was at the pastor's house, Parson Jonas Clark, one of my favorites, and she observed what went on from the window. It's an interesting thing when we hear, and I always tell people, don't you think for one minute that we fired the first shot. We did not fire the first shot. I can prove that through over a hundred affidavits. I had one that just came into my uh, possession last week that I will be reading at Bunker Hill Day for all those people that try to say that we didn't fire, we, they fired, uh, we didn't fire on them, or we did fire on them, we fired first. No, we have affidavits including who later became Mrs. Hancock, that she watched the whole thing. So that was quite a thing to, to observe and to know, wouldn't you think, say? Now she married John Hancock, August 23rd, 1775, in Fairfield, Connecticut, at the home of Reverend Burr by Reverend Elliot. They honeymooned in New York and Philadelphia. You can imagine why they were honeymooning in New York and Philadelphia, because their honeymoon was to be there at Continental Congress. Beauty, politeness, and every domestic virtue, said John Adams about her. And John Adams, incidentally, was also a frequent visitor to her father's house and was interested in her as well. She had a very warm friendship with Martha Washington, and they had frequent visits. She was also known as very generous, hospitable, and resourceful. Well, I trust that in this short time that we've been together here today, I've certainly given you much to consider, I know. And I perhaps, and maybe not quite so subtly, issued you a challenge for your own lives and for right now, our beloved Republic needs you. Founding fathers, yes, and founding mothers too. Someone has stolen our country. I know I did not sell her or give her away, and I want her back, and I want her back now. Amen.